this is a section which is pretty much devoted to, to uh, very practical things, how to interview. Some of these uh, materials have been um, uh, provided by experts. Some of them have been prepared by staff. Oops, we're still on there. Um, and so this is one of the key sections that I advise um, take, taking a look at. Um, the uh, second main section is our resource guides on different, uh, different subjects. Um, some of these are very ex extensive uh, spreadsheets about where to go, pretty much uh, aimed at international uh, sources of information. We have, uh, we try to st uh, steadily expand these, improve them, and uh, keep them up to date. Um, uh, some of our um, recent ones, the human rights, the human rights uh, one, the um, uh, LGBTQ issues is one of our more recent uh, additions to this, to this list. So, um, we did one on freedom of information. Um, I'm sorry, more into the mic, I apologize. The resources guide, if, if they're good, good question, thank you. The, the best place to start is on help in the upper right hand corner. And um, I should note that we're, we really mean help and uh, there is a place for sending in questions and we genuinely hope that people do send in questions if they have, in, if they want to know something that we might be able to help with. We have a, a long list, several hundred people who have volunteered to answer questions and we... Uh, that one is underneath, um, Go under reporting tips and tools, and then there are two categories there. That's the first category, and that's the second category, right? Yeah, that's, um, thank you very much. That's really part of what I wanted to make sure people were aware of, is that things are sometimes a little bit uh, hidden, inevitably, when you have lots of uh, materials, perhaps. So each, uh, each resource usually has a bit of an introduction to it. This is one we just did on uh, freedom of information laws. Then we go on to have a, a listing of, of countries and resources within each country that hopefully will be useful in, in uh, helping you if you have questions about the, the uh, local or national uh, freedom of information um, laws. In the same section, we have a, a, a set of tip sheets. There's another program on FOIA. Uh, right after this one actually. Um, <clears throat> but we have a series of tip sheets that we've consolidated from about a dozen different tip sheets that people have prepared in, for different countries. And so we've tried to include all of those and also winnow them down to some very useful universal lessons about uh, how to handle uh, FOIA requests. Yes, sir. Nope, they're permanent. Uh, additions, or, or they're always they're always there, and we do try to uh, update them. Um, that's a, a bit of a uh, always a bit of a, <laughs> of a of a struggle, as you can imagine, because we're posting so many new things that we have to then try to integrate them into the materials that we have online. But all of these materials are are there permanently on the on the website. Thank you for that that question. Yeah. So. Um, here we have a, a, another one that uh, one of our illustrious colleagues who's here has, pre has prepared on, um, and uh, this is another program that's, that's later today about what to, how, to you, how to use information in the United States to help watch what's going on in, in your country. So this one has been up there for um, some time based on some materials from a more re a, a recent conference, and we're updating it at, at this conference. So in that sense, we'll be uh, imp improving this uh, this page by by uh, uh, putting up the, the latest inf the latest information. So there are I'm giving you kind of examples of some of the kinds of pages that are that are here. Some of the pages are fairly uh, lengthy spreadsheets. The uh, one on human trafficking, for example, has maybe um, about 60 different uh, 
uh, databases that you can, you can look at. We're also trying to increasingly uh, show example stories of superior work that's been done in a particular subject matter. It's my feeling that journalists like to be copycats, and the best thing to do, well, a, a gr great thing to do, is to suggest stories that they might want to take a look at and think about about doing. We do the in the freedom of information area. We have a column called uh, uh, FOIA This, where we try to point out stories that people are doing where they've used the fo freedom of information law to actually generate a story. Uh, this is. Um, uh, an another snippet from one, uh, an excellent series we have on extractive industries, very exhaustive uh, uh, resource on how to cover, uh, uh, not just how to cover it, but where to look for, for information. This is just kind of, a, of an example kind of thing we do, which gives you very detailed um, uh, suggestions on where to, uh, where to go look for information. Um, this is uh, another uh, screenshot of our new LGBTQ uh, uh, page. As you can see, we basically are trying to point out uh, uh, pretty precisely where to go for, for information. Uh, and this, this, uh, website, this page goes on quite extensively. Um, we tried to paint a rainbow here, but it didn't quite, doesn't quite work. But, um, the, uh, again, it's, it's based on our, our research with uh, help from people we've gone to for, uh, for advice, and we've tried to compile it in a way that makes it, makes it useful for people who really want to dig into this kind of area. And we've supplemented that with some uh, materials that are um, uh, intended to try to give you what, what, what people are saying about how to do the, how to do the work and examples of, of very recent stories in this area. For example, uh, some really terrific uh, international work on um, doing data set, creating data sets about uh, transgender murders, which are underreported, things like that. So we have some, we're trying to combine examples of stories plus some of these deep um, uh, data, databases, uh, or at least spreadsheets of, uh, of sources. So, um, we uh, can't do this without people who give us give us advice. Uh, this is, as people have said, a, a community of investigative journalists. We'd very much like to get suggestions of uh, new topics. Um, these are is, uh, on the page permanently, but uh, we are trying to. We want to expand uh, on the number of pages we have. We certainly um, want to um, get uh, suggestions for things to include that we may have may have left out. We try to be exhausted when we do our research on this, but there are so many resources, uh, so many websites to uh, be included on some of these databases that we'd love to have uh, more suggestions and um, uh, corrections if, if possible. So um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, but I uh, really want to encourage you to uh, bring, bring ideas for us about what we should be putting on the website. This is uh, uh, your uh, network and we want to make sure that we're responding to uh, the needs of the community. Are there any other uh, questions that I can answer? Sorry, it's sort of a quick introduction, but I hope you will avail yourself and realize that you should uh, dig down a little bit deeper into these uh, uh, resource pages. All right? Okay, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Govind Raj, Ethiraj. I'm the founder of India Spend. We're a data journalism initiative based out of uh, Mumbai in India. We, uh, we were set up with the primary intention of improving the quality of public discourse. Uh, we do that by using data to tell stories, and we do that in primarily four or five areas, which is uh, health, education, environment, gender, 
and crime and occasionally a few other areas as well. But predominantly our coverage or our effort is around health and I'm going to talk about health and what we've done and how we've built an approach in health and covering health uh, in an area which was really not done till we started doing it in the way we are and I'll demonstrate how. Uh, the same principles that we've used here somewhat apply to other areas as well, uh, education for instance. So we started about uh, five years ago and uh, one of the things when we started was to ask ourselves what do we want to do in health and how do we want to approach it. So it's always a good way, good thing to look at children and child and child mortality or uh, infant mortality and say okay if I can I trace the whole life cycle of a child who grows up and what are the factors that play uh, come into play when it comes to understanding what will ensure the child will uh, you know uh, let's say be nourished well uh, and thus will not be malnourished will get good education will uh, go to school or college in, in a good school or college and then become let's say a good contributing citizen to society. So there are many factors that come into play and as we've done that we found also the linkages uh, by looking at the data we found the linkages sort of falling into place. So everything that we do in some ways whether it's education, health, gender, everything links up. So most social scientists will tell you the same thing that for a country to progress you need to have all these basic things in place. So what we've done in our own way is to arrive at these conclusions and continue to arrive at them by using data and large data sets and trying to understand what's going on or interrogating those databases as data journalists would tell you. So the first thing, one of the first things we started looking at uh, uh, a couple of years ago was infant mortality. So this is a background, so everything that we've done continues to play a role in what we are doing today. I'm just trying to chart the path that we've used and how that path could potentially be replicated uh, in other places as well. Uh, a larger background on uh, databases and India. Uh, most journalists are always disappointed or unhappy with the quality of data available. I would argue that uh, in India the quality of data is, uh, or, the, or the amount of data that's available is reasonably good. The quality could be questionable but if you're if you get used to doing this kind of work then you learn to make allowances for either poor quality data or poor quality uh, collection of data or uh, let's say the synthesis of that data that's being done most, in most cases by government agencies because when you want to look at large data, large data sets, they're, they're the only guys who are, uh, who are doing it. So uh, the, the trigger to, and I continue to sort of stick to the background, the trigger to say a lot of the data coming into public domain in some ways goes back to uh, 1995 when we had the, uh, sorry, uh, 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 let me give you the exact year. Uh, it's 19, yeah, I think it's, yeah, so some of you are from America, you have the Freedom of Information Act, so India has uh, had the equivalent of that, which is the Freedom of, uh, the Right to Information Act. So a lot of the flow of data uh, began about 12 or 13 years ago with the Right to Information Act coming into force, and many people, apart from journalists, started asking and seeking data. So this was one of the key pressure points on the government to actually start working to put out data more proactively than wait for people to ask questions. So this was one part. The second part was what we call in India flagship schemes. So the government uh, and su successive governments have been working on flagship schemes focusing specifically on uh, rural health, on roads, on rural employment. So one of the things that they, the governments have done in recent years is to ensure that Let's say you spend a uh, billion dollars on this project, on uh, let's say rural rural roads. So a certain portion of that, maybe five or ten percent of that, would actually be reserved in data collection and data synthesis, and uh, and ensuring that that data is put put out in public domain. So two sets of data that uh, uh, we look at: one is put out by federal and state agencies. Uh, let's say in the case of health, which I'm uh, going to talk about more, but it could also be. Again, a federal uh, uh, effort, which is like a flagship scheme focusing on a particular uh, aspect of uh, the country, which could be roads, it could be health, it could be uh, maternal, uh, 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 it could be maternal health, maternal mortality, and so on. So, when we started working on health, I said the first thing we looked at uh, was this. Uh, this is almost like a Bible for us uh, in India. It's the National uh, Family Health Survey. Uh, there have been uh, several over the years. There used to be a 10-year gap uh, uh, between the uh, subsequent surveys, but there are now supplemental surveys which also give us a lot of information. So we started focusing on uh, infant mortality, like I said. So if you look at the 
uh, number 19 uh, and 20. Uh, these are the two key areas and a lot of our stories are actually on these points. One is focusing on infant mortality in general. Uh, the current infant mortality in India is about 41, is, is 41 which is lower than uh, what it was if you see in the previous decade, which was 57. That means 57 children per thousand were dying uh, at, as infants. Now it's 41. And uh, there is, of course, a difference between urban and rural India. The other worrying figure for, and we report a lot on it, is the under five uh, mortality figure, where you can see that uh, it's 50 currently, or 50 children die before, uh, before they turn five. And uh, that's something uh, to really worry about and focus on. So this is something that, we've, uh, that we started following. So we said that if children are dying at a young age, uh, either bef below five years or at, uh, at birth, so what could be the reasons? And uh, what, what drives it? And then potentially, what can be done to fix it? At least as journalists, how do we report on it? So here's a continuation of that. Uh, between, I, I talked about the previous decade, uh, 41 children did not make it to their first birthdays. But here's the point, right? So when you interrogate data and uh, you come out with figures, the important thing is also to compare. So we said that in India, we've, obviously we've done, uh, we've shown some improvement between the previous decade and the current one. But if we compare it to, let's say, our neighboring countries like Bangladesh and Nepal, then we are still worse off. So in some ways, that's a larger lesson for everything that we do. That one is to uh, sort of draw comparisons within the country, maybe within, uh, between regions in the country, and there are sharp disparities between rural and urban, for instance. The second is, once you've done that, how do you actually start comparing across any, for any metric uh, across countries? So we typically, in our writing, we look at uh, uh, Brazil, we look at China, and China is a good example to look at because that's also a large country with more than a billion population. So these are the trends in infant mortality, deaths per thousand live births. You can see the numbers improving, like I said, but when you finally place it against uh, neighboring countries, it doesn't look so good. So what are the responses? And I'll come, to, before we come to the reason, so our responses have been immunization. And then as we looked at immunization figures, we found that uh, we were obviously lagging quite badly. So this is a sample of a report that we've done. And many of our reports, like I said, will keep visiting and revisiting these topics. Uh, this talks about uh, the regional problems, right? So even within India, there are states like, a, like Gujarat, uh, from where the current Prime Minister Narendra Modi hails, which is considered uh, a very developed state, uh, industrialized state, but clearly is lacking or lagging when it comes to immunization records. So it tells you something about how, let's say, governance is being managed or mismanaged in a certain region, even though a large, the larger average for a country might be, uh, might be positive or good. So these are trends in immunization. Uh, you can see that in 92, 93, uh, if you see the red part, it means that anywhere between 0 to 30, I mean, I mean the level of immunization was less than 30. That means 30 children, uh, less than 30 per 100, right? 30 per 100 children actually got any immunization. So, and whereas you can see the disparities uh, in some parts of the country, it's better. And then, uh, because the, as you can see, the slide is switching between uh, two decades. You can see how it improves dramatically. But even by looking at this chart, you know that we've not development uh, from a health point of view is not uniform. It's not something that uh, we've managed to do as a country in a uniform way across the, place, across the country. So this is a problem. Uh, now, having said that, okay, we have a child, uh, we, have, uh, we have a problem of infant mortality, we have a problem of children dying before the age of five. Then we say, okay, uh, what is the response? The response is immunization. The next step, who, who do you actually, uh, who is in some ways responsible for this? Who, who can you, uh, who can you in, pin the blame on? I, I mean, not to, I, mean, I don't want to use the word too lightly, but so in, I mean, the answer is really mothers. And we said, okay, if this is, this is the data that we've got so far, now look, let's look at what mothers are, uh, uh, what, are the, what is the data around mothers, whether uh, uh, at, at various stages of life, right? So one of the things that we've established again with the regional disparities is that regions which where women are healthy have the healthiest children. Now, this is obviously very logical and, uh, you know, it doesn't require data to tell you, but it's always good to arrive at this with data, and which, like I said, mostly helps in good, sound policy decisions. So, we've again seen how the, as the quality of maternal care is improved. So, we've established that children are, are uh, not in good shape, but as we start looking at mothers, we see that as the quality of maternal care improves over the years, the, uh, every, I mean, uh, the, obviously the 
quality of uh, the child's uh, life medically also or health wise also improves. So it's the same uh, national health survey starting in 92, 93 and then seeing that how the number of antenatal checkups for uh, pregnant women are much more than ever before. Here are some indirect reasons. Uh, this is a story that we've just published, uh, which, is, uh, which says that basically 732 million Indians have uh, no access to a toilet and uh, are at risk of diseases. Uh, population 1.3 billion roughly, so you can see how uh, the, and, and again, as we've pointed out through various uh, rip in, uh, reports, the, there is a direct link between uh, poor sanitation and malnutrition and health uh, of the mother and the child. So then we come to education and we say, okay, now we've established two or three aspects of why children are malnourished or uh, don't live uh, until their fifth year, why mothers, uh, why they may, not, may or may not be immunized, why mothers are not in good shape. And then we see how it links to education. And we've, again, through data, and uh, you can go to the website and see our stories, you can see how as women get more educated uh, or as the data show, starts showing higher education levels with women, we also see that they have healthier children. These are some of, uh, these are sort of what I would call uh, collateral uh, fallouts of uh, more educated mothers, uh, fewer child brides, healthier children. And finally, we come to, uh, I mean, it's not finally, but let's say from education, we come to empowerment and we say, okay, now let's look at the data to see how many women are working and what is the, what are, whether there's a correlation between working women, education, and the, uh, the health of a child and the, uh, the, propen uh, the likelihood that the child will live to see his or her sixth birthday and uh, go to school and so on. So again, a direct linkage. So, so this is really what we do. So uh, I think we've, what we've managed here is let's, by using health and child nutrition or child mor uh, chil uh, chil uh, infant mortality as a starting point and closing, uh, and closing off at uh, a women's education and women's empowerment at the, at the last point of the, of, the, of the graph, we are able to show what the linkage is. So the social scientists will tell you very obviously that if there are more women who are educated in a country and there are more women who are self-employed and self-empowered working, then the, the quality of life for everyone in the family improves. Right? So we've also had stories, for instance, which show that women are malnourished. One, for instance, there was a study uh, very recently that we carried uh, in, in, in families and homes because they don't eat till the end. You know, in Indian families, uh, women oftentimes eat, eat last. And uh, that typically, uh, I mean, that typically reduces, one is, of course, there is, uh, uh, I mean, the usual health, uh, let's say, adverse effects of uh, not eating on time but it also affects the, uh, the nourishment level. So if women just ate on time along with their families and children, a lot of, particularly in rural India, they would be better off. So that's, I mean, that's slightly corollary to what we've, uh, I've been talking about, but that again shows a linkage between the overall nutritional chain and, uh, uh, and health and uh, children and women. So I'll, I'll pause there. I think this is, uh, this is an example. We'll be happy to take questions uh, if any. My question is, uh, when you're comparing with the other countries, what data do you use? Do you use you know, uh, UN data or World Bank? What, what do you use in your comparison? Yeah, so it could be WHO, uh, World Bank, uh, mul mostly multilateral, inst multilateral institutions, yeah. So it's a very uh, it's a very loaded question. I mean, you know. So uh, are you talking about government data specifically? Yeah. So I think what we are clear is that for most, I mean, almost all our stories, our headlines will not change, or the context, or the uh, the tenor of the stories will not change, even if let's say there is a 10 or 20 percent variation in data. You know, that's one. Secondly, and let me show you the last slide. What we always do is uh, we try and correlate it with other findings on other surveys or other uh, uh, studies being done by maybe research organizations, privately funded organizations. So we may use a large data set from the government of India, but we may correlate it with a much smaller survey, let's say being done in one corner of India. So, I mean, as one example, I mean, we may use 
two or three or sometimes even more in one article where we're trying to be uh, comprehensive. So usually we find that it all points in the same direction. And like I said, the, the, the top level findings or the headlines that we arrive at rarely ever would change even if there was a, a data variation. But it, it's good to assume that there is, there is some element of error in the data. Yeah, uh, just answer me find this. Hmm? Oh. First one. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we keep, I mean, yes, sex ratio is something that we've done a lot of uh, work on. So your question is what? Why, what is changing in this or? It is, yes. It is, and we've done a lot of reporting on this. I mean, I can, uh, I can, sorry? So if you see the sun preference, uh, there are, uh, this is really the, the sex ratio story. Preference for suns, I mean, th which is fairly common in. So if, if, I mean, what we've shown is the correlation between uh, higher education levels for women, possibly empowerment as well, empowerment defined by employment, and the fact that they will not necessarily want sons uh, and are okay with, uh, are, are gender neutral in their choice and therefore there won't be abortions and so on. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Margo Williams, and I am the research editor at The Intercept. Um, before that, I was the research editor at many other places. So um, I've been a researcher as, uh, in newsrooms for almost 40 years now, and um, I wound up at The Intercept, which is a great place to be. Um, so I'm going to talk more about uh, some kinds of tools to use to get at data in the deep web. Um, tomorrow, uh, Janina and I are going to do a, sec a session about searching that we, that's called Beyond Google. But I'm just going to show you some examples of databases that reach across borders. And um, this is just some of the stuff that we'll be discussing. Um, so when you're doing a search, the, for me, the most important thing is to figure out before I start searching what is the answer that I want to get and what is it going to look like, which then guides me to where am I going to go to look for these things, not just throw something into Google. So I want to think about um, who is going to have that answer? Do I, do I need to go to a government agency in India to find the answer or can I use a, a US database or do I want something from a newspaper or do I want you know, something that's data? Um, so what kind of format do I expect the answer to be in? Is it a, a, a law or a bill? Is it a, a document from the NSA? You know, is it, do I want a spreadsheet? Do I want a database? And that helps you do a search, even if you're doing it in Google, to do an advanced search where you would say file type colon XLS if you're looking for 
Excel spreadsheet. So I could say, I want to go into the traffic division of the District of Columbia, and I want to find spreadsheets that they have about how many tickets are, are given out by the police. So, um, so I think about what I want to, to, to get and plan in advance for that. I also want to uh, figure out what keywords I'm going to use to, to get started. Um, have to stop and think, is this thing going to be online? If it's a newspaper from 1947, I'm not going to find it online. I have to go to the library and get the microfilm. So you have to think about which places you're going to go. Or does it even exist? Um, I, my example that I, I if, if I was online that I would show you, would, would be I have a database that I've been working on um, uh, right now that I'm maintaining. It takes data from three different government sources and puts them together. It's never been put together like that before. So if I was looking to find out who are the people who have been charged and convicted of terrorism in the United States since 9-11, that's, that's what my database is. I had to take data from the prisons and data from the courts and data that came out of uh, press releases from the Justice Department and then put them all together so that we have a profile of each prisoner and we know when he's getting out. So it, that, that didn't exist and so we decided it was worth the effort to build it ourselves. Um, and then the last question that I have just added to this, because I'm going to talk about some of these, is it free? You can't just expect everything is going to be free. So um, I'm going to show you some of the databases that, that you can subscribe to or convince your editor to give you the money to subscribe to so that you can actually get better data that's been collected already and it costs money because what we do, we, you know, we're not free. I mean, where I work now is free, but I buy my newspaper every morning. People expect, you know, that you might, it might be worth something to pay for it. So the same thing with data. Oh, and I have a, I have a good announcement. How many people were not on the Paradise Papers project? Not. Not, right? Not. Um, Marina just told me that as of tomorrow, on the offshore leaks database that's on, you know, online that has the uh, Swiss leaks and the offshore leaks and it, you know, had Panama uh, papers in it. Starting tomorrow, they're going to put the data up for the Paradise Papers. So you'll be able to go to that same database. It's going to, once they add that, there's going to be 525,000 companies in their database that they, that's online. So. We'll be waiting for it tomorrow. Finally, we'll get to see what's in it, right? Um, so in, in the US and in some other Western countries, uh, we subscribe to LexisNexis. And this is like a huge database uh, that's been around since 1980. So if I want to see the New York Times back to 1980, I, it, it costs a lot of money. But we use this. Company profiles. There's uh, every company. Um, it, most companies in the world have a profile in this that comes from Dun & Bradstreet and it comes from uh, SEC filings. I can, can see I have like a Germany company. There's so much stuff in here. But you have to pay to get it. Or I think some libraries may have it. So here's some of the sources that, that I search in Nexus and you can search them all together. English language news, German language news, uh, Dun & Bradstreet, market indicators, uh, newspapers from Afghanistan. I mean, there's just uh, a, a whole wealth of information in there. And, and we have subscriptions to it for everyone in our newsroom. And um, this is something that's only available in the US, but uh, there are several other sources for this type of information that you pay for. It's a search that goes through all of these different kinds of public records. Um, but because you're paying for it, they bring them all together. So you're not just going from one site to another, which is usually what we do to get records for free. Um, this compiles uh, phone numbers, you know, uh, business names, uh, land records. So you can do one search in here to find out if, um, if your government leader has bought the property in his name. You can check in here to see where their property that they own in the United States is. You know, so, or if you know the name of their shore, offshore company that they used to buy the apartment in Trump Tower, 
you know, then, then you can um, search across the country if you have this. Yes, I guess question about the similar names. Um, well, with this kind of report, you get to see all the addresses too. So you could say, oh, it's this person who lives in this city. Or you see a little bit of their social security number, not the whole thing. You see uh, two, five of the letters, you know, of numbers of their social security number. And you have to try to confirm. You have the phone numbers, you can call them. You know, I mean, the phone numbers are in there too. And their neighbor's phone numbers and their previous, their ex-wife and uh, a lot of this information is pulled together. It, this information is here on you also. If I've looked up your name in this, find, we'd find out information about you. Okay, so have you used flight radar to track flight? Do you have a question? Yeah, looking at flight radar. Yeah, so I was just like looking at flight radar the other day and you can see all of these planes are going to this way. And that's because they are Syria, right? So um, it's like a no-fly zone over Iraq and Syria. Everyone is just going around. Um, you can zoom in on flight radar and see each plane. Um, and it's live. Um, it, the information doesn't come from governments. The information comes from people have transponders and they're collecting, uh, they're collecting the data from the air. And you could get one of these transponders too and put it on your roof. And they even offer it for free. Um, if you promise to put your radar on the roof and leave it there 24 hours a day, they give you the equipment. And then you'd send it back to them and it becomes part of this uh, flight radar community. Um, so, the flight radar is free, but if you subscribe to it, which I just, which I just did, you can get another level of, um, instead of just seeing the, the flights of currently or going back a few days, with the subscription that I have, and I can't remember how much it cost, it, it was like for, for a year, um, you can go back, play back, play back flights uh, uh, for half a year. So if you're thinking, Oh, did I know that you know Trump flew to some place or somebody flew to meet him? I, there was like this whole thing about Roman Abramovich. It, did they did their were their planes both in the same airport on the same day? You can go back in time if you know the tail number of the plane and try to figure out where uh, where a plane was over um, six months. And you can download the data and, and play it back yourself. You know, you could put it on your site. Um, so this shows just this month how many, uh, in which places people have added their data to, to the community of flight radar. So you, you can see they're trying to get this, uh, this is just in the past month, so two African volunteer to put, the, put their data up in Australia, a couple of people. But you, you can also go to the slide that shows you where they all are, it's like just full of flights, people contributing the data. And this is what, if you wanted to participate and add the coverage, you, you put in a request and they, they send you this thing and you have to put it on your roof. I'm thinking, I don't have a roof, but I was thinking, about what, what if I did it in my office, you know, I'm in DC, I wonder what they would think if, you know, the, the people who spy over us all the time see that there's a transponder on the roof of the, of the building, I, I think, be, I want to do it. Um, so, so I, just by chance, right, I was like looking at, um, I was looking at flight radar and I, I saw an interesting plane and I was interested in it because it had a U.S. tail number and N, N, on, the, N on the tail means it's a U.S. registered plane. I was like, what, what is this U.S. plane that keeps on going back and forth between Egypt and, you know, it comes to US, it goes to Egypt, it goes to Shannon, like, what is this? And it just said private owner. So, so I looked it up in the FAA registration, which is on my tip sheet, and it turns out that it was owned by the Bank of Utah. Like, what does that mean? 
Well, Kelly Carr and Jamie Dowdell just did this amazing project about the planes that are registered in the U.S. because registering your plane in the U.S. is like being offshore. You, know, you can register it under a bank's name. Nobody ever knows who's behind it. And uh, it only costs $5 to register a plane. So this family in Venezuela, a, 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 a plane crashed into their house roof and, and killed their family, um, family members. And the plane was registered to like Bank of Utah in, 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 in the US. And Kelly and uh, Jamie uh, dug into like who owns all of these planes and, and, and you know who's responsible. So this shows, this is a slide from their presentation and it shows how many aircraft that they found were registered to non-US citizens in, in these uh, banks in these locations. So it's, it's a pretty interesting tale. So I was wondering about that plane and it belonged to um, DP World, that's the port, the Dubai port uh, company that has ports all over the, they tried to, to, to buy the ports of the United States and Congress rose up and you know, really hated it. But you, could, you can track this guy's plane, see where he's going, and maybe they're interested in buying a port someplace else. Like, so you could, you could track his business by seeing where he's going. I mean, I think that that's one of the reasons why some wise businessmen have their tail numbers blocked so that you can't see that they own the plane, that they're allowed to block the, the tail number from the, from the uh, databases. But because this is, you know, competitive intelligence. Like if you see where the, where the head of a company is flying, you might be able to see where the business is, is going. Um, so this is another source that's free. How many have used Enigma? Enigma.io. You have to sign up for a password and log in, but he, he, they've made it completely free. The, the guy who created Enigma, um, Mark Da Costa in New York, he uh, was charging for it for a while, but he, then he got businesses to pay. So he, it's free to the public, but he has business customers who they do uh, compile like private uh, data reports for them. So one of the things that I want to point out, because how many use Panjiva or some of the other tools for following cargo? Yeah. This one, for free, has the U.S. Uh, bills of lading and, and, and U.S. Uh, cargo descriptions and container numbers and whatever. So among the many things that is on uh, Enigma is the uh, cargo shipments But putting in a plug for investigative dashboard uh, from the OCCRP, um, they have a, uh, a data source that says search in documents and databases. If you go to this site, it, t it shows you all over the world links to uh, public records information, in particular corporate information. It's, if, I think if you just type investigative dashboard into uh, into Google, you'll you'll come up with it, um, and it's on my it's on my handout that will be posted later today. This is something that uh, that we pay for, but this part of it is free. It's called Arachnus Compass. Arachnus is a fee-based database system, but this page they put up for the public to look at, and you can also you could see you could you they have this type of information. And you just put in, you click on which one you want, and you say in which co country, and it comes up with a list of links to, uh, to the sources of information in that country. And you also have to sign on to this for a free, a free login to get into it. Besides liking to track planes, I also like to track boats. And this is a, a site called Super Yachts, and it has the top 100 most expensive yachts in the world. Um, 
And you can see number one, two, three. Like number three is the one I was watching. It used to be number one. And then there's there too much, too, two more expensive yachts have been built since uh, Roman Abramovich's yacht was, was, was bought. Um, and so when you, uh, if you're interested in a yacht, you can then go into marinetraffic.com and look for that yacht and look for its numbers, you know, and so that you can, you can follow that yacht. So um, it, it was the second largest yacht as of whenever. Now it's the third largest yacht. Um, where's my marine traffic? Uh, see, at this point, it was the most expensive yacht. OK, so here's marine traffic. And I put in Eclipse, and I get this report on, um, on Eclipse. It's, and and um, there's a longer report that you can see that tells you more information about, about it. And, but on the day when I looked at it, it became very interesting to me because it was, it was over here near Tenerife. It was, it was starting to go that way. And as of Sunday, it will be in Palm Beach. Um, we can see that this is the, the, this is the route it's taking. And so once again, Mr. Abramovich's yacht is going to be near Mr. Trump's winter home. So there'll be all kinds of rumors that start like, oh no, Abramovich is going to meet with Trump. You know, that's, that, uh, I gave a story tip to my colleagues and they haven't written about it yet. Um, so on marine traffic, you can also get alerts. Okay, so you can see here, I'm completely nuts. I get alerts in my Google Mail every time one of these yachts that I'm following leaves or, or, or lands someplace. So we're seeing the Eclipse is one of them, and the others are uh, Eric Schmidt's yacht, Sergey Brin's yacht, and Larry, Larry, the, the Google owners, I follow them around wherever they go, their planes and their, and their, and their, and their yachts. And then, you know, Mr. Uh, Abramowitz. So you can get these alerts in the mail. If you pay them more, if you pay them a subscription, you get also, again, more tools and more ability to download stuff and more alerts. Um, This is a, a source that's free. It's called Security Assistance Monitor, and it, it's from a nonprofit in DC. It looks at the government, US government records of how much and what kind of assistance go to other countries. So you can see for your country which weapons are being sold from the United States, which, which um, tear gas is like some of the stuff that gets recorded. And you can also go into uh, the US database of contracts and see what companies have contracts or grants, to, both are in there, in your country. So this is for South Africa. Um, uh, this is fiscal year 2018 and 17, and uh, uh, how, many, uh, how much money uh, and how many payments were made for U.S. companies or foreign companies doing business with the U.S. government in, in South Africa. So you can, uh, you can drill down, get to the names of the companies, and is Deloitte, right? Um. Oh. It's another plane. <laughs> I know, I, mean, I, I keep on going over and over the plane. This is our... Um, FBI director, Mr. Comey, as he was fired, you know, he, um, he, was, he went home, there, there was his jet, you could look up the, the plane, the tail number on it, like, th th he was no longer the FBI director, so I don't know why he was getting this free trip back on the, on, on the government plane. I guess they wanted him, they wanted to get rid of him. So, um, so this is what you would do, you would like look up that plane in the FAA registry, and you could see who owns it. So it wasn't owned by the federal government, it was owned by something called 10X Aerospace. So I 
was interested in what is 10x aerospace. Oh, and here was the flight of the plane, poor Mr. Comey. He was in Los Angeles visiting his employees in the FBI Bureau, and he found out on TV that he was fired, got into the plane, and flew back to DC. I looked up that company, and as you can see, they have a, they have a contract with the FBI for leasing jets, uh, very large contracts, many payments. Um, yeah. This is how much, $28 million in leasing of the planes. And here was the contract, actually, for the, the and you ha get the documents if you go into this other database, you actually see the contracts and the, um, the payments. And you also get to see the people who applied to get that. So this company applied to get it, so I wanted to look that up, you know, who are they? And you can see they have a special mission serving the, the DOD, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security. So this is the jet and what it looks like on the inside. And then I looked on the board of the company, and there is the former director, you know, Hayden, uh, at the Chertoff Group. So you can see they had a kind of inside deal on, on getting a government contract because of the revolving door. So um, if you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer, if I can. Yes? Um, in, in trying to get uh, access to commercial databases, you mentioned the possibility of using libraries as a way to get to them. You mentioned that some ha have limited access, but, but some access. Can you talk a little bit more about other, other strategies? I know sometimes you can get a trial subscription to some of these, which may be long enough for you to get your answer. Um, and, um, and maybe also talk a little bit about what, what uh, might be useful as a technique for, for uh, convincing your editor that it's really worthwhile. Yeah, one, one trick is always getting the trial database on your own and doing a really, really good story and, and then presenting it to your editor. Because um, a lot of these systems have tri trials, you know, um, and often you, then you end up with some annoying salesman calling you about, like, well, you had the trial, now are you going to buy the database? But, you know, you can, I've had trials, I, 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 I do that on purpose, I want to see what's new, so I get trials all the time. Um, you just have to remember to use it. Be strategic about you know using your trial and not not using it up. Um, I have library cards for many different libraries around the country because different libraries have different access to data databases that you can use from home. Like my DC Public Library, I can get. Um, I get mixed up with them. I have a Baltimore Library card where I can l read the Baltimore papers going back throughout history. I have a DC uh, Library card, and they have access to, I think, JSTOR, which is the academic, uh, academic uh, publications. I go to the Library of Congress. I spend days sitting there because they have every database for free uh, if you're in the building. So I, I go to National Library, I did that at British Library too when I was there, go, go in there and see what they have available. So I, and they also, at Library of Congress you can print for free, so you can, and you can download to your um, thumb drive. So I just sit there for days and download stuff, and so I'm getting, I'm getting it for free, databases that I don't have. Yes? Um, well, there's so much information available from UN and World Bank and and uh, and WHO and you know I. That's like a whole session to talk about the, what's in there because it's also it's pretty complicated to go, you have to learn their codes and you know and use use be really wise about using their data but it's 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 all free too so it's it's really really good. Yes. Um, a 
As far as if, uh, open corporates, do you use open corporates? Yeah, I mean, I always start with the open corporates because they actually put the names of the company officers in there. Um, now the British, the British is, uh, office is free. I mean, and that's just like totally amazing that the records are, are now free from, from the UK. Um, does anyone have Mint or Mint? No. You see, there are some really fantastic corporate databases that I don't have because they're too expensive. I had another job where I did have it. And at OCCRP, they have it. If you call the people, if you call Miranda, the other researchers at OCCRP, they, um, an investigative dashboard, that's the, that's the investigative dashboard. They also have a service where they'll help people with uh, answering questions because they do have these databases and, and they will help reporters. So that's what I would do. Anybody else up there? Or any questions for the other panelists? We're happy to sit. I mean, we, there's just lunch coming up, so we could uh, sit here for a while, or we could just uh, like try to get there first before the plates are gone. Oh, this is when I was looking at Nexus. I was looking at, because they, com they compile all the information, but what I do is I go into the New York City land records, which is free, and you can search for uh, names and, and see who, holds, uh, who owns apartments in New York City. If you have a name that you, if you're thinking you want to look in New York, you can go there, because that's where a lot of the uh, purchases have been from the you know, offshore money. And you can look, you can do the same thing for San Francisco. Uh, the, the thing that makes it easier with Nexus, which is, free, you know, not free, is that they put them all in there. You know, that's what you're paying for to, to do that. Yes? Not the documents, but the data is going to be on mine. So all the names of the companies, it's just like the, way, the offshore leaks. It's going to be in that same database, that offshore leaks. So it's going to be the names, it's going to be the people, and then it's going to be the diagram that shows the connections. Um, so they're putting that tomorrow, they're going to add the data from um, Paradise Papers to the offshore leaks database. So it's, it's going to include everything at this point. 